what kinds of reasons do you imagine people having for choosing a VR life over this life? I think a lot of different reasons. Um, one thing that's worth worth saying is, you know, for many people, if your access to physical reality is great, then you know, virtual reality may have a high bar to meet. But yeah, for a lot of people, access to physical reality isn't all that great. Um, you know, take uh, aging people, for example, or disabled people who may have relatively limited access to uh, to physical reality, uh, just the ordinary physical world. In fact, you know, virtual worlds like Second Life have seen really major participation from aging people, disabled people, uh, oppressed people who maybe you know can't live the full life they want to live in physical reality for various reasons. Often find meaning in these virtual worlds as well. So I think if you're in a situation where for whatever reason, life in the physical world is not treating you all that well, then, um, then virtual worlds can open, up, can open up possibilities. But then even beyond that, I guess, uh, what are some of the other possibilities include, for example, you know, new kinds of experiences and new kinds of worlds that go beyond, say, the physics of this world. You, know, you can fly in a virtual reality even now with wings, you know, in a way in which you can't really do in the, in physical reality, you can imagine all kinds of new transcendental possibilities opening up. Oh, another, another thing um, that I think about sometimes is space in VR, you know, space in the physical space in the physical world is very limited, at least at the moment on earth um, material goods in the physical world are, are very limited and a whole lot of you know injustice arises from the scarcity of material goods and of space that's where a whole lot of inequality comes from in virtual worlds there's this feature potentially at least of abundance you know like material goods are trivial to duplicate take in one house you can just uh, duplicate it digitally just like that now you've got uh, now you've got another house space is maybe not free but but very, very abundant. You know, you can create a new planet in VR without uh, without too many difficulties. So I think that abundance opens up interesting possibilities for things like you know equality, distributive justice, social justice. I don't think it's a panacea. You know, I mean, there's this idea out there in the tech world that yeah, in VR everyone's going to have a uh, a mansion by the beach. You know, that's not going to suddenly get rid of uh, get rid of inequality because you know the forces of inequality run very deep but i do think that this uh the prospect of uh, this kind of abundance at least has interesting possibilities for making virtual worlds attractive yeah it it does um to the extent that these are biosims these are these are you know homo sapiens here in base reality plugging into a vr um you know, like it is, would they, would that be parasitic on people in, in base reality, sort of somehow maintaining their bodies and like, what, what do you envision practically speaking here? Is it, is it Neo in the pods or, or, or what? <laughs> yeah, it's a big issue. I mean, there are so many different models and I, uh, it's a, it certainly is a, a big issue. Yeah, so what, what happens when pilot. the base reality, uh, base reality body needs to poop is what I'm asking. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who's to say it could be like Neo in the, in the pod. Maybe the, uh, maybe the body is just inside this tank that takes care of its every need, feeds it nutrients as necessary, uh, gets rid of bodily fluids and substances as necessary. Um, I don't know, works it out as necessary. I don't know. This is science fiction, but if we're, if we're going to a version of this centuries in the future, uh, who knows what? That's one possibility. Another possibility is, okay, we're not talking about full-scale spending 24 hours a day in VR, but maybe just spending 12 hours a day or 18 hours a day or whatever in VR and coming out uh, of VR at least to, to, uh, to eat and drink and maybe to sleep and, and so on. Now, maybe that sounds weird. On the other hand, is that so different from the lives that, Many of us live already spending, I probably spent 12 hours a day in front of my computer already. Um, and yeah, I, I take some time off to, uh, to, do, to do other things. I can at least imagine that kind of relationship to VR. And yeah, keeping the physical body healthy is going to be super important insofar as we're 
insofar as we're still embodied in our biological bodies. I guess the third option, at least in the long term, is the possibility of, act of actually uploading to the simulation completely so that we're no longer biosims, but pure sims, where we are ourselves digital creatures. You know, this gets illustrated in, um, in some science fiction scenarios like that, um, you know, the episode of Black Mirror, Black Mirror San Junipero, where yes, a couple yeah, yeah. towards the end of their lives actually uploads themselves completely mm -hmm. to the simulation and live their life that way. <laughs> That's one way of uh, getting rid of the problem of the, uh, the physical body. You now have a digital body. But, but what, so what, what about the, the, the brass tacks of like how you look, how, how you look and what you ask to be called? Do you, do you, you know. en envision people just like, I'm going into the simulation, uh, you know, I'm not hot on earth. I want to be hot. I'm going to be super hot in the simulation. I'm going to go by this. I never liked my name. I'm going to go by this other name. Do you picture people making those kinds of choices? Yeah. And I don't need to just picture this because it's already happening. You know, there are social worlds uh, in VR where people try on all kinds of different identities. I mean, this got really going in a big way with, I guess, Second Life, which is not a full-scale virtual reality. Um, it's, it's just on a two-dimensional screen, but people go in there and in Second Life, people try on all kinds of new identities. Yeah, different bodies with a, with a different gender, um, uh, clothing, different clothing choices, different names, different, uh, different occupations. Um, and now there are, yeah, now there are virtual VR worlds like a, a VR chat is probably the most popular one, but yeah, people get the craziest avatars to express all kinds of aspects of their identity. Some people go in with real names. And if, actually when I enter virtual worlds, mostly I stick with kind of boring avatars that look a little bit like me and I use my name. So I guess that's a continuous social identity. But yeah, there are many people who try on entirely different, um, entirely different identities. There are disabled people who go into, into VR. Some choose avatars that reflect their disabilities. Some choose avatars that, that yeah, have entirely different abilities. Um, so yeah, I think this is very, this is very complex. You know, social identity is complex enough in the, uh, in the non, in, in the physical world, but I think it's just going to get all the more complex with, yeah, it's at least open to people to associate quite different social identities, maybe even different social identities in different virtual worlds, especially when people are experimenting with different aspects of their identity, maybe VR, virtual worlds for some people provides a realm where they can experiment when they're not quite ready to do that in physical reality. So I can see the ethical application of this to, to peoples who, who, whose lives are marked by suffering in, in base reality. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm thinking of just people that are, you know, perfectly happy in base reality, but just want to be much happier just like normal, uh, normal people that have good lives, um, that have enough money that they're not worrying about where the next meal is coming from. Um, but they have the, I guess, normal level of problems with meaning and happiness, uh, that even a well-to-do person has. And this gets into uh, the, the, the sort of experience machine thought experiment, which, which I've, I've, talked about with uh, Robert Reich on this podcast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, I think very much in the spirit of your defense of virtual reality as, as valid, I've always thought that when you say, you know, the experience machine is just this idea that you could <clears throat> plug into a virtual, a fully immersive virtual reality that is just much better. And it's, it's uh, quote unquote fake, but you're having, you know, you can just have any experience as vividly as I'm having this experience right now. And you can live your whole life in there and you can, you know, whatever your idea of a great life is can be programmed. Like you can, there can be no disease. If, if cancer is what you fear, there's no cancer in, in the experience machine. If pain is what you fear, there's, there's no pain. Um, if pain is uh, a necessity of happiness doled out for the right reasons at the right times, then that can be a part of the experience machine. 
all of, you know, it, it, just depending on what happiness is for an individual, it can be just given to you directly in, in the experience machine, including experiences we would think of as, as suffering, right? Because suffering can be a component of, of happiness for people in the right context. Um, I've always, you know, the, the, I think it was, it, was it Nozick who initially proposed the experience machine idea and, and yeah, Jack, yeah he, he said, even in this case, even in the best case scenario, even in the case where the experience machine is not just, you know, not just having orgasms and getting drunk and not paying the consequences, right. Where it's a deeply ethical and happier version of a life, we should still reject it. And that that's all, all always you know never made sense to me because uh, you know it just seems like what what matters to me is conscious experience at the end of the day. If everyone could plug in to the to the experience machine, I think if you reject that as immoral, it's possible you're just not imagining clearly enough how good it could be for everyone to be in the experience mm-hmm. machine. So. Does that strike you as right? Or what do you think about that classic thought experiment? Yeah, it's interesting. I think, I guess I have one major concern about the experience machine, as Nozick describes it. And that's that it's entirely scripted in advance. Mm -hmm. Life in the experience machine, as he describes it, is pre-programmed. You get in there and you get to live out a script where you have these wonderfully meaningful experience and experiences and maybe you get to be the world champion in your area of concern and maybe you get to have great relationships and a wonderful family and achieve all this justice but it was basically all scripted in advance and you're kind of it's a little bit like you're passively living out a script and yes you did get to have great experiences along the way it felt great but the question is how valuable is that if it doesn't really correspond to something that you did. And maybe the thought was, if it was scripted, it wasn't really something that you did or that you achieved. Mm. So this is the the point, I guess, where maybe I'd be on Nozick's side and say, okay, yeah, we really want to actually do these things, not just have have it feel like we did these things. We want to actually do these things and achieve these things. We want to be in a world where things are somewhat uncertain and still manage to get the right outcome. I would argue that can actually happen in virtual worlds, like in most social virtual worlds you go into now, we still have free will, we can make choices, we can construct our own lives, it's not scripted, it's not pre-programmed, but maybe that's a difference between the kind of VR worlds that are, uh, that are actually coming now and those ex- extreme thought experiment that for me means even if you, do, even if you reject the experience machine for this reason, um, those reasons don't extend to uh, to virtual worlds. Right. You can still maybe even if life in the in the experience machine is at some level meaningless, life in virtual worlds is, in a corresponding way, meaningful. 